Welcome to A Chat With Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm here to guide us on this journey of heartfelt and uncensored conversations with friends I've met while touring my music in Europe and across North America, and people who have life experience that I genuinely believe we can all learn from. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. If we just talk about it, we could shut up. I was on a hike today with my partner Dale and the sun was shining and it was above zero Celsius and I remember saying to Dale that this is the most present I've felt in a long time and I chalk it up to a lot of things catching up with work stuff committing myself to not over committing myself that's been something I've been working on my whole life I've stopped chasing the illusion that in order to be successful or to stay in the game, I need to say yes to things that don't align with my current values or that I'm just not feeling right about in my gut. I really try not to make decisions based on the fact that I am afraid if I don't, it'll make me appear a certain way to others. So what I'm saying is I'm trying to make decisions based on the fact that it feels like the responsible thing to do, it brings me joy, it benefits myself and others. So I'm making decisions based on love instead of fear. That that's a big that's a big thing. I'm not naive though. I know that I could feel differently next week, next month. I have felt this way before. And that the work to be healthy and have a good, simple life, that work is ongoing. Anyway, I just wanted to share that personal feeling of um, being present and personal well-being with you, my little heartbeat listeners. I feel super grateful for it right now. And I wish the same for you, even if it's just for an afternoon. Maybe this feeling of joy and presence is also for the fact that I've received so much positive feedback from you about this podcast. Thank you for all of your calls to the Heartbeat Hotline, for listening and sharing and talking about the podcast amongst your friends. Where we'll end up, I don't know, but I am open and hopeful that this podcast will continue to be a safe space for Chats with Heart. My guest for this episode is a new friend I made in 2021, although she feels like a friend I've known my whole life. I've learned so much from Melina Kazanavichis already. Trigger warnings, if you're new to a Chat With Heart podcast, we open up about the light and the dark. In this episode, we mention the pandemic, depression, and suicide. We also celebrate life, laughter, and F-bombs. Since losing her sight due to diabetic retinopathy 26 years ago, Milena has been riding the roller coaster of life, dealing with depression, skydiving, volunteering with organizations such as Frontier College, CNIB, Friends of the Public Gardens, and advocating for all pedestrians for safe streets in Nova Scotia. Milena is incredible, and I can't wait for you to hear more about her journey. Ah, uh, it is great to hear your voice. And you just turned 50. What, do you feel any different? Was it hard? Was it like, yay? Or like, fuck? <laughs> no, I actually, I don't feel any different. Um, I'm, I'm a little, what's the word astounded that I made it to 50, uh, considering your you life? Know, <laughs> your well, journey. yeah, well, well, yeah, my life. And, you know, and you and I talked about this previously, that, you know, in my younger days when my brain was in a very unhappy mode that I that I did try to commit suicide three times, particularly after I lost my sight. 
Yeah. And then there's not looking after yourself and the dialysis and kidney failure. And then you get a kidney and pancreas transplant, which I celebrated 21 years of that this year, this January as well. Wow. So getting to 50, I'm like, hmm, OK, I made it here, motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're now a fucking I- survivor. It's incredible. <laughs> like, yeah. So God. honestly, I have to say, Christina, I'm tired and I don't think I'm tired because I'm I've turned 50. Um, well, you know, this whole all this COVID stuff, number one, like everyone else, I'm nothing special. Then you throw a little blindness in and immunosuppressed stuff and then all the advocacy that I'm involved with. And, and last year was a crazy busy year. And this year doesn't seem to be slowing down either. And there, there doesn't seem to be that break where you can get away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um, shit, like you guys were supposed to be on tour somewhere in Europe. I know a little bit about what you're experiencing. Not all, but in terms of... Like here we are, we, our tour was canceled. We're home. I am busy as fuck. Mm-hmm. And there've been some great opportunities, like things, have, things that have come about despite this tour being canceled or because of this tour being canceled and opportunities kind of flipping and, and now being able to do this podcast and um, other things and be home. I do love being home. I love routine, but like I have to work extra hard to say no to things because I'm someone who gets really over, really overwhelmed as you, you haven't even known me for that long, but I'm sure you can, I've confided in you before when I felt overwhelmed. And I don't know if you do this, but I really do come to these days sometimes where I literally go, I got to drop some, something. Like I thought I could do it all when I was feeling good and strong. I said yes to this, this, and this. Yep. And I should have known that there are, times when I need downtime. I need a break. I need to refuel. And I, it's not, I don't allow myself that. Are you a little bit like me in that way that you're like, I can do this. I'm excited about legitimately excited about doing all these things. I feel passionate about all of it. And then you get worn down and you realize, oh, fuck, I didn't, I didn't consider that like this would consume me. Yeah, definitely. I'll take on a project knowing full well, more than likely, it's not going to be a matter of one discussion with a certain group of individuals or or whatever. But more and more consistently, it's, it's proven to be that you take on a project. And when it comes to advocacy, a lot of the times there is all this fucking bureaucratic bullshit yeah. And you have to talk to one department to get an answer from another department. And, and then the, that, that department has to talk to the fifth department and things take on. For, and then there's emails coming and going where really, to me, I've asked your question. Send me to the direct person who can answer it. Don't make me go through three different departments because that's what exhausts me. That's what takes. Yeah all that energy. And, and in the meantime, other things are coming by. You're like, okay, this project's going to take a little bit longer than I thought. So you yeah. take on other projects and all of a sudden that project that you, you, you started that you thought was going to take a little longer now starts to roll again. And it's, um, it builds up it, and it takes a toll. Yeah. Do you have somebody to help you with some, some of this stuff? Do you like a, an assistant or is it all you when you take on Oh, then, no, it's you. it's never just all me. I mean, in some of the advocacy groups I'm with, there's some like walk and roll Halifax under Bill Campbell's directive. He, oh, I love him. He's he's a great mentor and he he helps. He helps a lot. He's retired from, I think, city work. I can't remember. But if I'm, I'm like, where is this bylaw? How do I find this? What are we getting into? And it's never when it comes to certain advocacy things. Well, pedestrian access, something that has to do with the blind and partially sighted. There's there's a few of us that are still banging the perpetual bars of HRM, but we're, we're tired. Mm. Fuck, who's not tired these days? Everybody's tired. <sighs> You've done some pretty wild things. Is it true that you after you after you lost your vision, you went skydiving? Oh, yeah, that yeah. But that was that was that was years after. So probably about six years ago. But I'm not. Still. See, I'm not I've never done it. I would yeah. never, ever do that. That's See, amazing. <laughs> First and foremost, I'm, I'm not the only person. There's been many, 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 many others who are blind and have skydived before me. But it, but it was also always something that was on a bucket list. 
prior to my losing my sight. Mm -hmm. um, here, here, here's how I solidified it in my head. So it's tandem. The, the, you're not jumping out of the plane on your own. You I have couldn't. the instructor strapped to you really closely behind you. It's quite personal. And and the best part of it, we we were the the whole circling around in the in the 1952 little Cessna plane, which is a small like it literally only fit the pilot. And then in the in the back there, it would it was uh, David, the instructor, and myself. That's it. That's all that fit in there. But it was so fucking phenomenal just to fly around. The the hangar is open and the air is coming through. And, and you know, he walked, talked me through on the ground what we're doing. Um, yap, yap, yap. And and he's he's like, OK, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to scream in your ear. You're ready on the count of three. We're going to rock it out of here. And so you go one, two, three, and then he flings you out when you're flying. And then I'm Whoa. like, ah, I can't breathe. I'm dying. <laughs> it's tapping on my shoulder. And I'm like, why is this asshole tapping on my shoulder? I'm dying. I'm yeah. never going to make it to the ground. And but he had said, you're going to think you're, you're not able to breathe, but you're able to breathe. And when you feel me tapping on your shoulder, I know what you're doing. You're 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 panicking. Like, like, yeah. And, yeah. And it clicked in my head. Breathe, slow down, calm down. And and then, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be like a 30 or 40 or 50 second free fall it felt a lot longer until that parachute ching oh my goodness pulled you up and then it was like ah oh, i never wanted to come down wow yeah it was great so that so my i guess my consolation on that was like eh, i'm pretty sure that if we crash it's going to be pretty hard and uh <laughs> hopefully i i fall apart in brittly little parts and swipe you know wipe me up and put me into the ground next to the yeah. big tree and, yeah. and and i said it's all on david now yeah, you won't get me bungee jumping, bungee jumping. That rope might snap or it would or it would go to the bottom and then pull me back. And then I'd my body would, you know, split in two pieces and it would be like a Stephen King show. Can't do it. It's good that you thought about this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. I wouldn't do that either. But you've got some other you've got lots of other exciting things that you've done. And even recently, you um, are you still involved in the is it aerial an aerial uh, class or a circus class? What is it called? The circus class. So Vanessa Furlong under Legacy uh, Circus, she ran a, a six week come try circus class. And it was seven or eight of us, predominantly female identifying. All of us had a disability on varying levels. Yeah. So I, I dragged my my friend, Stephanie, who's blind. Oh, we drank way too much wine one night before the class. Oh, or yeah. So I'm like, so Steph, I'm signing up for circus. You want to join? She's like, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, you're always looking for something new to do. Come on. I said, it'll be fun. We'll we'll get to be on the trapeze and, and maybe walk a tightrope. I don't know. I actually don't know what we're going to be doing. She's like, yeah, OK. Anyway, then probably this was a month or, or six weeks prior. And then Vanessa sets it all up. And then jokingly, I said to stuff three days before we're going into class. I said, so listen, um, you know, that thing. I said, you and I are going to partner up. And when we're swinging through the air, you're going to let go and I'm going to catch you. Whoa. <laughs> She's like, what? Yeah. Anyway, we, 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 didn't, we never got to that stage. That's a lot of practice. But yes, I, I, um, I like that there's a big, big metal hoop yeah. that hangs off the ground. And, and, and it's up to you whether you want it one foot or three feet or 20 feet off the ground. So I managed to get my fat arse into that hoop. <laughs> And do some some sexy poses in there and balance in the center and hang upside down. And That's it was awesome. great. That's and awesome. you know, the best part of it is there is absolutely no room zero for the brain to permit you to think about anything else except don't let go of the soup because it's going to hurt if you drop. Yeah. So like you're in the state of flow, like you really can't think of yesterday, tomorrow. Well, unless you're thinking about dying, I suppose, in the <laughs> middle of it. But you're so focused on the task at hand that like it's exhilarating or it must have been. We only did it for the six weeks and, and um, hopefully it will start up in the spring. And and you really have to work a lot of your muscles where I for me, I'm like, I haven't worked muscles for a long time. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. So. You walk a lot, though, obviously, with the well, walking is one thing. But then but when you're doing when you're doing the aerial stuff, you you have to have good upper arm strength. Yeah. And I and I used to I used to have that um, years ago. I also did pole um, pole dancing yeah. classes. That, I love that. That was oh, great. Fun. Yeah. That, so I think there was eight of us. I was the only woman who was blind. Um, 
And I really, I really enjoyed that. But I was, well, I was more fit. Forget about the, <laughs> you know what? Forget about the advocacy. I mean, seriously, it's exhausting you. Milena, the Lithuanian pole dancer, uh, clothes on or optional if you want, whatever. <laughs> Speaking of Lithuania, that's where you spent the first seven years of your life. Do you have any memories from? Well, I was born in Konas, Lithuania, back in 1972, the 4th of January. Communist country at, at the time. Yeah, it was it, it was a communist country at the time. And, you know, my my parents, well, dad was studying and working and my because my parents are young. So they had me and I was predominantly flipped back and forth between grandparents. That's the grandparents. And it, but it, I mean, it, it was good. It was different. The cobblestone streets and the old architecture and things have changed very clearly since the USSR fell apart and, 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 you know, North America yeah. values have moved in Western, more Western society. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Things, th- things have definitely changed. Um, and both my grandparents are deceased. So th- there's a couple of cousins that I chat to via email here or there, but there's it- actually no real connection for me anymore. Yeah. Um, and I haven't been back for, for quite a while. So you so you you move over to Canada with your parents when you were seven. Yes, and and my and my and my baby brother was two. Yeah. Okay. And you grew up. Where did you grow up? At Calgary, West? Alberta. Well, we lived in Vienna for a year, and then we ended up in in in, in Calgary, Alberta. There's a pretty big contrast between Vienna. And uh, Calgary back in 79, which is when we when we when we came to this country that um, Calgary was still being built up. It was it was not what it is today. Mm. My parents hit the hit the ground running. Mom went into vocational school. Um, Mm -hmm. Dad went to work right away wherever he could. And uh, they haven't stopped working ever since ever since they landed. They landed in this country Um, and Alberta despite all whatever the mentality is out there now, it it really is astounding. I mean, take a look at those Rockies. Yeah. I've always enjoyed touring out West and performing in Calgary and driving. And the rivers and and the valleys and lakes and uh, a little different than Nova Scotia. There's, there's no Rockies here. I'm not a big ocean fan, but Nova Scotia is my home now until I can get to, I don't know where, where are you going? Let's go somewhere. Let's go somewhere. Well, I'm, go? I'm not going anywhere just yet, but I actually think there's definitely been a transition for me anyway. I For years, all I've done is plan on where we're going, where are we going and, and how are we going to make a living and doing what we love. And and really, this pandemic has made me appreciate uh, being home and really I, I, the enormous amount of waste that's involved in in me traveling and, and, and touring and thinking about how I can reduce that and kind of change, just change the plan. And I don't think about traveling as much anymore. Or or when I do think about it, I think instead of like it used to be, we're going to travel to, you know, work. That was how we could afford to travel and see the world. And we loved it. But now it's more like, oh, I wish I could go drive down and visit my brother in Columbus. Like now I'm, I'm starting, I'm getting to that point in my life where I'm like, oh, I'd love to just travel as a tourist or to visit yeah. a friend and not be, you know, worried about the gig that night and really just have time with the people that I care about. So where are we going? Let's do a, we could do a staycation. There are so many great, beautiful places and people really in Atlantic Canada that I have yet to discover. So yeah. We could definitely uh, go somewhere. So, yeah. So tell us about Calgary. What were you doing before you moved to Atlantic Canada? Well, I through grade 12, I was taking some floral designing courses. And then and then once I finished high school and I, I was working in the flower shops. And then within the three years that was assisting managing about three different shops. It was great. It was it was what I you know, it was what I wanted to do. And then my father was contracting in uh Hibernia, Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. I think I think it was a six year term and I was flying back and forth. And then mom, mom decided that she didn't want to be in Calgary anymore and they didn't want to do this traveling back and forth. So they were going to move not to Newfoundland, but to Nova Scotia. And at that point, I had I had my own apartment and car and living the dream. What do we know when we're 21? We're so stupid at the time. 
Mm. And yet I thought I knew everything, but <laughs> it sounds like all you need when you're 21, all, really, if you have a car, it's like life is just yeah. great. Really. Yeah. Freedom. And you're assisting managing shop and you got the apart- apartments. And so anyway, so they were moving to Nova Scotia and mom's like, you're moving with us. And I said, I don't think so. There were some discussions, which to this day, we disagree. I still say she gave me an ultimatum. Mm. <laughs> but we're family and, you know, we have to move. I said, no, part of me probably did need a change of scenery for a bit, mm-hmm. given some of the friends, let's say I had. Yeah, at the time. Yeah. So your parents were trying to look out for you, I guess. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Most parents are like, see you later, alligator. It was mostly my mother. Mm hmm. And, you know, you'd, you'd have to ask her what what her thought process behind all that was. I know she wanted out of, of, of Alberta. I know that for a fact. I think my father did, too, because he was on contract all the time. So anyway, so I took a leave of absence from work to my boss's chagrins. They try to up my pay and give me all these benefits. And, you know, I chose to go for the year and see what was going to happen here and with every intent to go back to Alberta and to resume my job. I mean, I was working in a pretty well-known flower shop and then you left. Yeah, and one yeah, and one thing led to the next. I've I've driven just about almost all of Nova Scotia cuz mom didn't like driving then and dad was in in Newfoundland so and they were looking for a home and uh and this was a fall and that's what made me fall in love with Nova Scotia the 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 beauty of it. Mm-hmm. Until we hit winter and I'm like, oh, Christ, the fuck is this? <laughs> really? Is our, our winters are not fairly mild compared to Calgary or no? Am I wrong? Listen, I was flying back and forth because my ex-fiance is in Alberta. It was minus 30 degrees. And if you bundle up, you're doing OK, except your eyelids are freezing and you think you're going to crack in half. And then when I'd arrive back here, it, it'd be, you know, minus 10 or 12. But it was more painful to me to be here still to the state because of the dampness because we're by the ocean and I I just can't tolerate it and having no iron in in my body I've never been able to store iron so I'm constantly freezing Mm -hmm. and everything hurts so and the snow piles and the nor'easters fall here is beautiful and you know I don't know when the last time you were actually on the peninsula here in the city there's one thing to say about development but I hate what they're doing now I absolutely hate it and you don't have to see to, to be able to feel that the beauty of Halifax itself is being torn apart. I, I was a little shocked when I landed in Nova Scotia. I'm like, but then, but then we, all the, the older historical homes, you know, it was kind of antique and, and now we're having condo after condo and after condo. Yes. And, and I know it's evolution and, and, and maybe it's needed, but I, I also think that we could be preserving a lot more of the authenticity of what, Nova Scotia and Halifax Dartmouth were mm-hmm. instead of putting all these glossy towers up. Might as well live in Toronto. Which ain't nothing wrong with Toronto. I love Toronto, <laughs> but <laughs> we've lost Toronto's lost a lot of its citizens to uh Nova Scotia, actually. I know. So you land in, in Nova Scotia and you're living with your parents at that time? I was I was living, I don't know, half a year, maybe. Mm-hmm. until they, they found their home that they were in Bootler's Point where they are now. And I was working two flower shops here. The drive from Bootler's Point was a little longer. So I so I actually then took an apartment in Lower Sackville and uh, and then ended up flying another friend of mine here because she was in a bad situation with a very abusive boyfriend. Mm-hmm. So so she moved out here. And, and then shortly after that, the sight loss started after I bought a brand new dark blue five-speed prelude. Oh, sexy. Oh, it was sexy. I don't know what this means. Diabetic retinopathy. Did I say that yeah. right? Yes. What, what What exactly does that mean? What happened to your right. eyesight? So I was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes when I was four and a half, five. And somewhere in the teenage years, junior high, high school, you, you get things in your head, you gain weight, you don't want to gain weight, then then you mess around with your insulin or you don't eat. Um, and I fell into the anorexia bulimia nonsense. And when you're doing that kind of harmful stuff to your body as a person who has diabetes, where your pancreas is not working and you have to take needles to, t- you know, to control your, your blood sugar levels, mm-hmm. the damage is quite harsh. Diabetes, I like to to call it the unseen disease where not controlling your blood sugars can cause blindness, amputation, kidney failure, and death. 
that being said, there's so much, there's so much heavy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, and my, my kidneys failed. I, my eyesight failed and feeling in my legs was, was going. And uh, so I, you know, I was heading for, I was heading for death row pretty much. Yeah. And not really giving a shit about it. Wow. I, I really, yeah, I really, yeah. I really, I really wasn't there. Uh, so diabetic retin- retinopathy, what ends up happening is when your blood sugar levels are not in control, you, you end up formulating in your body what is called uh, ketones. Mm-hmm. And, and they're almost like little tiny drops of acid in your system and not the tablet acid for getting high. Because <laughs> you'd probably enjoy that, wouldn't you? Never tried it. I have no desire. I'll just Me either. The, I do have a desire, <laughs> but I do have a desire, but I'm waiting till I'm 80. I've mentioned this before okay. on the podcast. But... <laughs> and that's and that's what does all the damage with the nerve and organs. And it weakens the blood, the blood vessels in the back of your eye if your blood sugars are not maintained to what they should be. And then they start to deteriorate. And every time there's a broken blood vessel, a new one tries to form. So it ends up being like a big spider web in the back of your eyes, entangling your visual cortex and your optic nerve. You know, it suffocates the oxygen out and causes quite often, uh, as a matter of fact, diabetic retinopathy in North America is the leading cause for people under the age of 50 for blindness. Wow. If you're diabetic. Now, that just to the listeners out there, not to freak everybody out because... (laughs) There's, you know, there's, 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 there's so much more advancement in, in diabetes care now. It's still, I mean, it's still happening. People, people are going to do what they're going to do, but there's a lot more advancement in diabetic care to but, hopefully yeah. help prevent all of this. I think it's a positive message to share, especially to young people, but really anyone that, that what, you know, especially if you have the diagnosis of diabetes, that you really do pay attention to what you're putting into your body, what you're doing with your body. I mean, I may have been doing some of the same things you were, but that it wouldn't have affected me the same way, you know? So yeah, that it is something to pay attention to because um, it can lead to these, these life changes really. But, yeah. You, you know. can have your cake, have your sugar, have a beer, make sure you're exercising and then eat healthy the rest of the way. I'm Lay down, s- have sex. Clearly, Sex is a good form of exercise. It can lower your blood sugar levels too. There you go. Yeah. And you, um, I did watch a, a presentation that you did for, was it called The Good, The Bad, and The Sexy? Oh, the, and, yeah, the, the Good, The Bad, and yeah, and The Sexy. When was that? I don't know, two, three years ago. Yeah, it was some, great. Put on by Easter Seals. And, and I think, um, was there six or seven of us women identifying with disabilities and just talking about lived experience. Mm-hmm. And it's typical because my, my head is always in the sex gutter. I think that that's fine. You know. Such a good stress relief. And I thought you were, I thought that was a great talk. Actually, I'll share the link on my Facebook page so that people can check it out when this episode's out. So there you go, listeners. Check out my Facebook page and uh, I'm going to share the good, the bad, and the sexy featuring Melina Kazanovich's and other women who identify as having a disability. Oh, in that, you actually, you mentioned something. You mentioned during the introduction that perhaps it's society at large that is disabled, that we're all thinking about it wrongly. Do you want to expand on that? I thought that was really, I thought that was really cool. It's like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have to go back a little bit to, to think what I, what, what I had said there. Um, and, and I know what you're referring to. Yeah. And there's a big movement now, especially with the, with the built environment and what is happening in Nova Scotia in particular, whether inside or outside, it's, it's society that is, that ends up being disabled, you know, disabling, I mean, I can get out and I can walk, I can talk, I move my hands, I just can't see. But if you're putting up barriers and barricades and I and I can't get access to my bus stop because there's a big hole that is barricaded in front of the bus stop. And so then I have to redirect myself somewhere else. And then therefore that society putting that disability on me and making me disabled, fix the hole, make a proper barricade, identify it clearly. Thoughts are changing, but but Still, there's too many, let's say, able-bodied people. I hate saying that sometimes because it sounds like it's the, it's the. No, it's okay. We need words to try and describe. It's them and us. And it must feel that way sometimes, us and them. And we're all guilty of it until we know better. Or sometimes people know better. They still don't do better. I mean, I'm guilty of it too. Well, I'm, well let's, I'm a, I'll give an example. I have yeah. uh, two friends of mine, who b- both both completely blind, both work. They're married. It's a, they're a married couple and they have four sighted children. 
And each time that the mom was coming home with baby number three or four, these are her words to me, is that uh, on the bus, it, it's been more than three times where people have come up and had the nerve to say, oh, how do you know when your child is sick? Because you're blind. Or how does social assistance let you have all these children when you're blind? I'm like, what the fuck? That's rude. Right? Yeah. What, what? And it, so, so there is a brain that is clearly disabled in the thought of, I think, I think that kind of commentary is a, is a little bit more than ignorant. I mean, there, there's, there's stupidity and then there's ignorance and there's people who don't know. And there are ways to ask questions. I'm, I'm open to any questions. That kind of episode, what I just described is, is pure ignorant. And I use this example quite often now that I, I'm one of my best friends. He was having a birthday party years ago and said, well, you come for the barbecue after. And I said, what are you doing before? Oh, a bunch of us are, are going to throw axes. And I said, well, you're not inviting me for that. And his, his reply was, well, how are you going to do that? You're blind. Because we were new in a friendship. And I said, what? <laughs> are, we, are we all, are we in different cages? I mean, am I throwing the axe at your head? What am I doing? I said, because I'm about to throw an axe at your head. Yeah, yeah. Because he was not aware. And so I explained it. And those kind of things don't happen anymore. But, but there's where the brain is, I believe, not functioning properly. Perhaps it's the able-bodied people's brains, thought processes that are on the disabled side themselves. It's not, it's not, sure. it's not me. It's not us. It's not the person who uses a wheelchair, who's a paraplegic or quadriplegic, who has numerous girlfriends yeah. or, or whatever the case. It's, it's the thoughts from able, of people that, you know, yeah, that- by all means, I mean, not everybody's going to answer everything, but I, I would rather see society ask in appropriate fashions than assume and presume. Yeah, it's interesting. How do we engineer our lives with accessibility and inclusion at like the forefront instead of like the afterthought? Because I think if that's something that we're learning about in kindergarten, you know, if if we can't get it at home, let's say, which, you know, that's another thing. We could be discussing these things at a young age with our parents, our parents leading the conversations. And then it's taught in schools. We're raising this awareness in everybody. And then it's, it, then it's a normalized. It's just a normal way of existing. And, and then, and I'm sure that's, that's the case today. Although I'm, I'm, you know, say, I'm saying, oh man, I wish I would have just grown up with this because I'm still, sometimes I feel slow, like to pick up or like, oh man, I should have known that, but I didn't, it makes so much sense. So for example, um, making uh, one of my events, uh, an album release show, I let everybody know, okay, this is going to be an accessible event. What did that mean? Like to me at the time, it meant for anybody living with a mobility challenge. And I wasn't considering invisible disabilities. We thought we had a, a plan. And then, you know, after the show, I, I did get, collect some feedback from some of the attendees. And, and one of them was just that, you know, there was no signage. I got to the venue I got dropped off, but I didn't know where to get in. So that there were these other things that weren't difficult to do. I just didn't know. It does require, you know, effort and thought and and being okay with like making mistakes and then just being open to not getting it right necessarily the first time. Uh, like keep trying. It's okay. Yeah. Well, it's, and that's yeah. the thing. And, and it's about, and it's about talking to it's about talking to to the to the disabled communities and populations and not yeah. just one person from each disability but but how does it feel nothing drives me more wickedly wild particularly when dealing with the HRM here is that oh they've had a conversation with one person who uses a wheelchair or one person who's blind such as myself and you know I'm I'm not the end all and be all um so I thought, I thought you, you were Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> only, only to you. <laughs> no. no, you're right, though. I'm yeah. sorry. I don't mean because to because you. because the, the truth of the matter is every person with every disability. And if I'm just to speak on on the blind and partially sighted side of things is you can have 10 of us in a room with the same eye condition, seeing 20 different ways. Mm-hmm. And some of us knowing how to use a barbecue, some of us being brilliant with computers, others perhaps being able to to knit blankets and sweaters um, where the others cannot. Not not a single person with a disability is the same. Mm-hmm. And and people forget that that. So, you know, when it comes to your venue, um, 
and the story that 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 you've that you've you've just told Christina, it's you learned you do better the next time and keep talking and, and keep that yeah. conversation open. And the truth of the matter is t- today, maybe, you know, we will get there, maybe not in your lifetime or mine, um, but we'll get there where, where everybody will be accommodated for um, accommodated. Um, I don't know if I like that word, just, you know, but well, everybody will be will, included. Every if you're included, invited, yeah. invited to the party, be yeah. able to have a good time, be able to, yeah. And then I think one thing I've learned is that it's really hard to even come up with, let's say, an event or an experience that everyone's going to want to do anyway. Like, well, that's right. So you kind of have to cut yourself some slack if you're making the effort and you're you're awakening uh, to wanting to be inclusive and think about what it is you're doing and, you know, just do the best you can for the people that are going to like that thing. Let people know. Hey, we've made these changes to be more inclusive, and what that means exactly. So you want you want here. I gotta tell. I'm just thinking about some, and you know, I'm not vegan. I know you are. I'm just I'm switching on something that will, yeah. will will align here. But I I am I'm a, a a big foodie, and I I love any kind of food. And I do have a favorite vegan restaurant. That's let me see if I was to walk to it about twelve blocks away, which is doable, not a problem. And since COVID, they they have actually shut down for eat in understandable you know it's hard to staff however it's pickup only they don't have delivery i think they're only using like uber or doordash or something like that so i have not been there to give them my money because yeah. when i called i said you have no delivery other services than than the doordash or the uber or whatever yes i said well i said i'm completely blind i said and i don't have an iphone therefore i can't access it the owner was like, well, you know, you could come up and pick it up. And I said, but I'm going to walk 12 blocks. I said, by the time I get back to my place, it's going to be cold and disgusting. Not even a clue and try to accommodate it in any shape or form. Mm-hmm. I'm not going. Like, Look, even even if they charge extra for that delivery, I, I'd pay because everybody's, you know, everybody's businesses are going there. I get that. What I don't get is not even trying to put an effort in. Well, like with, is it 40 40- thousand citizens that are partially sighted or blind in Nova Scotia. Is that, is that. Yeah. We, the, the, it was 40, 40 to 50,000 as of 2017 who are blind and partially sighted in Nova Scotia alone. And those numbers I know have in, increased um, because of our provincial migration and our new Canadians that are here as well. And, and I know that CNIB in particular is looking for individuals who who can speak Arabic and, you know, numerous other languages so that they can assist the people who who are coming from all around the country and all around the world to live in Nova Scotia right now who are blind and are partially sighted. So those numbers are even higher now. And I'm sure a large amount of those people would like to get a burger. Uh, <laughs> you know, like when well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the winter during COVID, like, but yeah. I'm serious, like there's a yeah. whole, like, like the economy uh, would benefit when you commit to inclusivity, then you, you open the doors for more people to know about what you're doing and to be excited about it and appreciative. Just if it's a good burger, like, you know, that's going to be a lot of repeat customers. Okay. So you got to change things up a bit. And maybe, um, that means, you know, making a financial adjustment or whatever, but like at the core, doesn't everybody just want to connect and you want to make a good product and you want to connect with people. You want people to be happy. So let's join this train, everybody. Let's take a little fluster break. My friends, Julie and Franz visited me recently and we loved reconnecting with this Canadian creation, the conversation game fluster. So right now I'll share one of the fluster questions and our answers and you'll find these sprinkled throughout season one of the podcast. My little heartbeat listeners, you can buy the game at www.flustergame.com and save 15% with my promo code, Christina15. What is one article of clothing do you personally find especially attractive? France. Christina's loungewear <laughs> is super cute and attractive. Thank you. I did invest in some nice loungewear. I actually, I love it so much. I've, I spent a lot of time thinking, is this something I could wear at a photo shoot or something? Cause I love it so much. But then I'm like, no, this, these are pajamas. Like they don't need to cross over. Like I don't. To Walmart. Yeah. 
<laughs> like they don't need to. I mean, it makes a lot of sense because we spend most a good part of our day lounging around, and why not do it in comfortable in style. and stylish, mm-hmm. cute matching clothes? Yeah, you've inspired me. I'm gonna. You're welcome. I'm gonna buy some cute loungewear. Yeah, it can be sexy and still cover most of your body. Well, I hope so. When you have kids running around, <laughs> you want to be need, covered. Not that you need to cover up. I'm just saying you, <laughs> but it's just I get cold, and I know you get cold, so I was thinking about that too. You can, yeah. So is there something else? Another piece? I think I like a scarf. That's like a sexy. Scarf. To you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the least sexiest thing I would think is. It's it's cool, but like I'm like, hmm. Well, I think when it's worn well, I don't know. I like a scarf. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. I was thinking a winter scarf. No, you were thinking like a, a flight attendant. Yeah, yeah, I yeah like, like a stylish like a rock and rolls. Kind of... Well, I really like the winter scarves. I like the winter scarf look. It's sexy. With, I do think it's sexy. With, with I don't the... think the question was sexy. It was attractive. Oh, it's attra- right? attractive. Oh, yeah. I don't know why. I I, I guess I seem I mean, attractive. Kind of stretch, with but... sexy, but right. yeah, you're right. It doesn't need to be sexy to be attractive yes. to attract mm-hmm. your interest. Like, That's right. I mean. Um, papayas. <laughs> Sorry. What? <laughs> Pap- <laughs> papayas can be attractive, and I don't mean sexually. Oh my god. No, I'm trying to think of a good example of what I mean by this dark chocolate covered almond is attracting me, but I'm not feeling a sexual attraction. Those are two different things that we commonly will interpret as. Do you one know what I'm saying? Yes, mm-hmm. yes. going to have one now. I have a feeling Dale's going to be receiving a pair of underwear with papayas in the near future. And a scarf. <laughs> a matching scarf. Well, tell us about some of the things in your life that you've done that you don't think you maybe would have done, you know, had you not gone through this two major organ transplants and uh, losing your vision. Losing my sight. Losing your sight. Yeah. Not your vision. Oh. Yeah, well, there, there's, there's there's this whole movement now to get. I I didn't lose my vision. I still have a vision of um, you Ooh. and Dale building sh- uh, chalets. Yes, and and I'll be the hostess. That's my vision. That's a beautiful <laughs> learn lesson that I just learned. Thank maybe you. maybe maybe I'll own my own brothel somewhere. <laughs> I share your vision for that. It's the new terminology. Right? Who can keep up with all of this? No, but it's political important. correctness and wokeness. Um. But I think that is the one thing I would agree upon is that it's, um, you know, losing my sight rather than my vision. I Mm -hmm. my vision's been blurred lately. (laughs) That's that is understandable. (laughs) Absolutely. What are the things you love about yourself today that before you lost your sight? Maybe. Maybe you didn't love so much. Um, I don't think I'm too concerned about what I look like in the mirror lately. Although, yeah, yeah. although, yeah. although when there, when there, when there's a pimple on my head, it feels like there's about 30,000 of them and it's the size of a bull mastiff, but, but, and then, you know, I'll have some, a sighted friend and say, how big is that? And nobody can see it. Yeah. Um, I didn't see the zit last time we were together and you were concerned about that. And I was, well, I was expecting going on a big one. <laughs> I know I was excited about it. I was like, oh, I hope she'll let me pop it. I couldn't see it, but <laughs> anything for you, anything for you. Thank you. Next time. Save up those white heads. <laughs> so I'll swing back to the to the sex part. I used to care. I'm like, oh, don't put on the lights or or whatever. And my my body image, and maybe it's because I'm not looking at those ridiculous magazines that were back in the day when I could see 28 years ago, um, depicting women in particular in only one in only one shape and size but to me now it's well i don't see it i don't care and then if i'm wearing my sweatpants with the hole in my knee i'm like, I'm the sexiest motherfucker there is <laughs> you brought the sexy back into sweats that's right and then i don't i don't know i'm i don't know i don't know if i can answer that because it swings okay. on a daily basis um yeah, yeah. You know, I'm. I, I feel like I'm. I'm. I'm on a, a, a ever sliding scale of what I'm liking, what I'm not liking, and and part of me sometimes, quite often, actually, is concerned. Am I going to settle? Am I going to pick something? Or am I going to stay focused on one item? And and um, I don't know if I ever will. I think I'm. I think I'm probably going to go into my grave saying, "I'll oh, bury me here," or "No, bury me there," or "No." And when even when I'm dead, I'm like, "What?" <laughs> not that I'm indecisive because I'm not. But I'm getting better at focusing in. I, I have made, you know, some clear decisions of, of 
you know, I'm, I'm definitely not going to do such and such item anymore. Let's say it's advocacy or at a certain aspect of advocacy. And I'll stick and um, focus to one directive when it comes to advocacy. But I think more so than anything else, it's 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 the kidney and pancreas transplant that I was given the gift of that somebody died uh, 21 years ago. That keeps me driving and moving forward because I did promise after I woke up after the surgery to my dead donor that I, th- I, I felt like I, I saw their spirit try to crawl into my bed. I, I really did, even oh, though I was yeah. completely blind already. And then, and I said, you know, I said, I, I know you're probably hurting. I said, but to, to me, I, I promise to be the best I can be, mm-hmm. which won't always be the best. Um, but we're going to do a hell of a lot of things. <laughs> That's amazing. So, and I got a, a few tears now because it's to this day yeah. it's still, but, um, I do too, right over here. He's <laughs> making me cry. Yeah. It's beautiful though. You know, so I think I like the fact that I, I'm working harder on on when those days come and their depression. Mm-hmm. And there's been some tricky moments just this past month. But you know, but I've got my my guide dog, Lewis. I'm responsible for him. I, I have to wake up. I and, and I'm responsible for a person who died. And I'm happy about that. And I think I've said this to you before, and I've said in some of my other interviews is that, I learned through a friend of mine, Anna, who's who's in New York. We met in university and I only went to university after I lost my sight because what the fuck was I going to do? <laughs> right. You went to Dalhousie. Is that right? Yeah. And so and we met in an English American literature class. Mm-hmm. And I always sat in the front because I wasn't I hated using my white cane and, and it was difficult to find a way out. You know, I was maneuvering around and everybody else sat behind. So I'm the only one in the front row. And Anna comes and sits behind me this one day. I think it's the second weekend. And she taps you on the shoulder. She says, I'm Anna. I said, oh, nice to meet you, Melana. She says, so you got a disease or something? Why doesn't anybody sit right next to you? <laughs> Why oh does my it? I don't know. Anyway, we hit it off right away. And um, and we maintained a friendship ever, ever since. And, you know, talking to her, we only get to talk once a year. She's got two grown daughters now. At one point, when she was in Montreal working for CBC, I went to visit her during a jazz fest and, and we were walking and we had a couple of drinks. And she says, you know, Melena, you and I wouldn't be friends if you weren't blind. Well, I lost my shit. I was like, what do you mean? What the fuck are you talking about? You're yeah. only my friend because I'm blind and blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, she goes, just calm down, calm down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I stopped and I said, well, how am I supposed to take what you just said? And then she said, think about it. Had you not lost your sight, you wouldn't have been at university. You know, you wouldn't have. And then we wouldn't have ended up in that class. That's she's right. You know, and, and everything just went. I turned to her. I said, I hate you. <laughs> yeah, I hate you for being right. And I gave her, I, I hugged her and gave her a big kiss. Right? <laughs> but it's true. And uh, so the friends that I have made. Yeah. You, the opportunities I've been provided f- for me. And maybe, uh, who knows? Maybe I would have achieved my dream of, of wanting my own flower shops and my, and and one kid and be a single parent and you know and be world famous floral designer maybe I would have I, I worked hard at that maybe I would have but that wasn't the that wasn't that wasn't what was set out for me that's the earthquakes happened mm-hmm. it all went under and uh it's taken a long time so and I've got fabulous people on my side I agree not about me but I feel the same way I mean I'm, I'm grateful Though we don't talk every day. I mean, I don't talk to, I talk to Dale every day, but I don't talk to a lot of my friends that often actually. And then when we do talk, it's, um, it's always meaningful and it doesn't have to be deep always, you know, yeah. it, it can literally just be a, eh, a grunt. <laughs> yeah. But I know, uh, you know, I made a promise to my brother who passed away before he passed away when we were young, when I was in my early twenties and visiting him in Toronto and um, he lived with addiction and I always say it, addiction robbed him of his, uh, of his life and of his, when he was alive, of his ability to be a, an artist um, for yeah. much of his life. And uh, he made me promise to never do um, cocaine. And I, I was like, okay, I can do that. I can do that. You know, I could try other things maybe, but, uh, <laughs> but no, but it was, it's yeah. sort of, you know, it was a promise to take care of myself. It was a promise to, to do all those things that he wasn't able to do because of, 
you know, this thing. And, and it was really, it was a promise of him to live the best life that I could as long as I, I can. And you made a promise to your organ donor. You know, sometimes it takes a promise to keep us in the game. Like, I can't do this for myself today, but fuck, I can do it for someone else. Oftentimes, like I've heard, you know, well, the person's got to want to do it for themselves. And I'm like, sometimes you actually got to do it. You got to do it for someone else, whatever it takes, yeah. whatever it fucking takes to make it to the next day, to make it to that time when something shifts and you are in your element and experiencing joy or it, experiencing flow in your work and connecting, you know, with uh, other people. And so I'm just so grateful that that you made that promise because my life has changed uh, for the better since, since meeting you. And, and it's, yeah, I'm learning from you every day, every day. I'm I'm learning from you and, 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 uh, (laughs) the fuck am I teaching you? (laughs) Well, listen, listen, and you know, and I, and I, and I wrote a couple of weeks ago about I'm losing my, my head here. and, And you wrote some beautiful emails to me as well that, and sometimes that's all it takes is an email. And, you know, we're both dealing with depression and, and it's, it comes and goes. And it's just mm-hmm. the last two and a half years. My God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sticking true to my promise. It is a promise to myself, but I'll promise it to you, too, that like I really I just I really do believe that like we deserve to do the things we love, but to do it with joy and to have those breaks that we need to be our best selves and to stay healthy. So I'm. I'm not asking you to make a promise back to me, but I'm going to make a promise to you that I'm going to keep my shit together and like not over fucking extend myself. I was reading, I think it was um, a young, young readers um, written by an indigenous author. And there was something about uh, coming of age on a reservation and, and so on. And an elder said in the book, and I'm, I'm not going to get it right, but if you fall into a fast moving river, do not swim against the currents. You will drown. Swim sideways till you hit the land and you can put your feet back there because the currents will move you to solid ground. Don't turn around and fight those currents. And I've really tried to remind myself of that when 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 things get whacked. Yeah. Why? Why am I fighting? What in the end is any of this going to matter? So um, swim with the currents. My friend, swim with the currents and let them carry you to that shoreline because eventually they will. Yeah. Boom. Mic drop. That was beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) That is how we're fucking ending this podcast episode. Cause, uh, (laughs) <laughs> when we first met, you're like, I'm on a fucking podcast. I'm gonna get this fucking podcast. I don't know if it's ever gonna get done. You're here. Yeah, you're doing it. Welcome to the Heartbeat Hotline, one nine zero two six six nine four seven six nine. I'm the host of a Chat with Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, a suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. Have a great fucking day. A Chat with Heart. Produced and written by me, Christina Martin. Co-produced and engineered by Dale Murray. Check out Dale's website, dalemurray.ca. The podcast theme song, Talk About It, was written by me and recorded by Dale Murray. You can find it on all the places you stream music. Production plans for this podcast and season one are supported by the province of Nova Scotia's Women in Business Implementation Fund and the Creative Industries Fund. Special thanks to Terrence Taylor for mentoring me on hosting this podcast and really digging deep with me on my production plans for season one, which, let's be honest, Terrence, ended up being more like well-needed psychotherapy for me. To Crystal Seaburger at Sensory Friendly Solutions, thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me learn how to be a more inclusive, accessible, and sensory friendly human. Visit my Patreon page to become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. Sign up at patreon.com forward slash Christina Martin. For this to be a massive success and reach 7 billion people, I need you to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts.
wishing you, my little heartbeats, a great day.